privilege again to be here by God's grace. I I just thought by the Lord's grace I'm going to be down here and the Lord worked it out that I'm here. And I just popped in on you all. I know that. I just popped in and I think sometimes like a bad breeze, you know, I came in, but by the Lord's grace, I'm trusting that I will be a blessing to you all. And even as the Lord has blessed me so much. Um, we'll talk a little bit this morning about a call to remember. Memory is a very important part of the human being. Our memory tells us about who we, who we are, where we came from to a great extent, the things we have been through in our lives. Our memories have taught us many, many lessons. And sometimes it's important for us to see that there are things in life that we need to look back to at times. If we don't learn from our past, we, I mean, it doesn't make sense. We have been through certain experiences in life. I have been through some bitter experiences. I've been through some good experiences. And I've learned by Lord's grace from it. I've learned from them. Most of them I've learned from. Um, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 32, and verse 7, we find that man of God, Moses, writing on the divine inspiration, he says, Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask thy father, and he will show thee. Thy elders, and they will tell thee. Our father, we come to you in the name that is above every name. We thank you, O God, for your mercies upon us. We thank you, O God, for the Blessed privilege, Lord, we have of being able to think back upon some of the things you have allowed us to go through, that you have led us through at times. We thank you, God, that our minds to a great extent can still function properly, Lord. Thank you, God, especially for your word. Your word which is able to bless us in so many different ways, O oh God. I ask, O oh God, this morning that you would search our hearts, O oh Lord. Remove the sin from our lives, O oh God. Anything that would pose a hindrance, O oh God, to your people being blessed, O oh God, in the name of Jesus Christ, we ask, O oh God, that you remove these hindrances, Lord. I remember that little boy who is not well, O oh God. I pray, God, you touch his body and strengthen him. We know, God, you said that you are the Lord that healeth thee. And we trust you, O oh God. May it be within thine will, O oh God, to do so. Now may your spirit lead us in worship. May he lead us through a word, O oh God. May he give us unction, Lord, that the hearts of the people, Lord, would be blessed. Come at all to thee, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When we think of the preachers of old, of course I'm not going into the Bible because we have several preachers in the Bible that they have been so, so instrumental in forming the way we think to a great extent. But when we go back into our history and we think of some of the preachers of old, our spiritual fathers in this church here, I am sure many of you can remember and look with admiration upon the memories you have of Brother Melbourne Cockrell. I'm sure your hearts are blessed in knowing him. And so too I have been blessed in meeting some of the preacher brethren in this country here. I still remember my pastor under whose preaching the Lord saved me. And I learned a, a good few things from him. But we think of these older preachers, our spiritual fathers, the elders who have gone on. And if we have, if we have been through certain experiences with them, and we have not learned from some of these experiences, then we are in a sorry state. Experiences in life are supposed to be teachers. We're supposed to learn from these things. I think of a... A preacher that many of us would quote all the time. We think of the great Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Spurgeon said at one time, he said, A time will come that instead of shepherds feeding the sheep, the church will have clowns entertaining the goats. And we have reached here. We have reached here. I, I, recent, uh, this past week I was reading an article about a preacher who rode a bull in his church to get people to come to the service. And when he made his altar call, more than 300 people came forward for baptism. And how did this happen? 
when the preacher decided that the crowd need to be entertained. Churches are not entertainment houses. Churches are places where we deal with the souls of people. And when God calls a man to preach, his purpose for preaching is to recognize that there are souls who stand in need of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the bottom line of our ministry. It's to go, teach, make disciples off, baptize them. Then after you baptize them, then you indoctrinate them in the word of God. That is why we are called to preach. That is in a nutshell what you and I are supposed to do. Mainly for preachers though. God gave us a great commission. So when Spurgeon had said a time will come that instead of shepherds feeding the sheep, the church will have clowns entertaining goats. That is so true today. You find that there are huge audiences. This Sunday morning, I'm sure there will be huge, huge audiences setting in some churches. And I use the word churches very loosely there. Setting in some churches, huge audiences. Look, I, I could have gone. I could have gone to a church service this morning right about 20 minutes away from where I am seeing. There's a big church here. They claim to be sovereign grace on their, on their, on, on their articles of faith. But I, I visited there already and I, I don't believe they are. And this morning would have been, it would have been like a curse for me because I'm sure they were going to have this Christmas stuff going on in their churches. We're supposed to learn. We find that the great John Bunyan in Bedford Jail, he wrote the book called The Pilgrim Progress, we know. He pointed out the fallacy of salvation by works. And he proclaimed a salvation only by God's grace. And these are things that we're supposed to look to. You see, we cannot be spiritual without being scriptural. You can only be spiritual as much as you are scriptural. And we, we, we must learn of these older preachers. We must learn from them. Today you would find that within the, 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 the religious assemblies, you would find that many of them are using phrases that are not even found in the Bible. This morning, I had the radio coming down on 6.40 a.m. and listening to some preaching. But my, the guy was preaching good until he said, well, Jesus Christ came to this earth to die to save you from your soul. Why not open up your heart and give him your heart this morning? And when I heard that, it got me sick to my stomach. I switched on to AM 600 and listened to politics instead. But these are the things that are permeating the churches today. These are the kind of things that you're hearing from our pulpits today. And even within some Sovereign Grace Baptist churches, you're hearing it too. You're hearing it from them. I preached in the church a few, about, I think it was three Sundays ago. And it started the church service with, Oh, come let us adore him. I was scheduled to preach here. I didn't walk out. But we find that there are lots of phrases that are being used today by preachers that are not found in the Bible. Lots of time you hear preachers saying, why not give your life to Jesus? Christ doesn't want my life, beloved. I, I, I can't see anywhere in the Bible where it says that we are to give our lives to Jesus. The Bible tells us that we are to trust the Lord in all our heart. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That is what we are to do. Present our bodies unto him as living sacrifices. Sometimes you hear preachers saying that the Lord is heartbroken and he's pleading with you to be saved. Oh boy. I don't know how you all feel about these things. But that is one of the main reasons I do not listen to a lot of religious speakers on the radio today. I don't listen to them. Sometimes... When you hear the things that are coming out from their, their lips, it dishonors the Lord. It brings God down to the human level. That's what they try to do. But of course, we know that God will not reach them. So what do we need? We need preachers who would preach the old-time Christianity, just like we find that Moses would remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask thy father, he will show thee. Elders, 
they will tell thee, we need preachers who would preach old time Christianity. This morning I'll go back into encouraging us to do so. Just as Moses said to us here, first thought I'd like to share with you this morning, and we don't hear talk about this very often, is that hell is real. How often do you hear someone on hell? We hear people, preachers preaching on sin, and they use the word sin very ambiguously. They do not, they do not point out sins. But one of the things we need to remember is that hell is real and not just for us believers, especially for us believers. We have to remember that. Remember the rich man? Remember one of the things he said to Father Abraham? He said, I have five brothers. I need someone to go and tell them. I need someone to go and tell them. The point I'm making this morning is that Many a preacher has forgotten the preaching of the existence of hell. They have, for, they have forgotten to preach about the reality of hell. But still, hell is real. And hell is still there. And hell is to be inherited by all those who reject the Lord Jesus Christ. But we have a responsibility. Just like Spurgeon said, we have the whosoever wills. And the whosoever want, we are supposed to preach whosoever will may come. And to those whom the Spirit of God will quicken, they will come. But the message is that we are to go out with it. We are to tell people, death is sure. Remember Hebrews 9.27? And it is appointed unto man who wants to die, and after death, the judgment. It is real. Hell is a place for all unbelievers. All those who die outside of having Jesus Christ as their Lord. Listen, I know a preacher today, one of my good friends. His wife, I love her, respect her. She grew up in church. Her grandfather was one of the, the most respected preachers I know of. And she grew up as a Christian. But it was way after she got married that she was really saved. Way after she got married. She grew up in church. From Sometimes we take it for granted that we have people who are sitting in our churches. They've been here since childhood and we take it for granted. Beloved, salvation is something when salvation happens, that person will know. And we ought not to take anything for granted, but we have to preach the message for every single member, young, old, not so young, not so old. We've got to preach a message for everyone that hell is real. And all those who read that, in, in the book of Revelation 21 and verse 8, Revelation chapter 21 verse 8, it says, But the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and murderers, among us, sorcerers, idolaters, all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire with burnet with fire and brimstone which is the second death. Lots of people are going to be hell and they're going to be in hell and there might be some of them who we know. That's why it's important. Never take the salvation of your neighbor or your friend or your brother or your sister, your husband or your wife. Never take it for granted. Talk to them. Let them know that Christ Jesus died, that salvation is a personal thing. If you have Jesus Christ, you will know. You do not have to doubt your salvation. It's important. Hell is real. It's a place of eternal torment. But what makes a person deserving of hell? When you reject the Lord Jesus Christ. We can sit in church. We can sing the songs of Zion. All these things. But you will know if you're born again. And if you're not born again. Sometimes, sometimes we do have doubts. I'm a preacher. I've been preaching for 43 years now. And sometimes I even have doubt too. But then the word of God would come back and convince me that he who hath the Son hath everlasting life. That the Spirit of God beareth witness with my spirit that I am a child of God. That these things are written that I may know that I have eternal life. And these, these are the words that would come to me. And so to each one of us, we must be convinced that Christ Jesus died on the cross of Calvary to set me free. 
you have to take it personally. He died for me. I don't know if he died for you, but I know he died for me. And you will know if he died for you. But we are to make sure and let that message sink in the hearts of our loved ones. The one who lies in our bosom sometimes. Sometimes we take it for granted. Not every pastor's wife is saved. Not every preacher's wife is saved. And I, I, I can say that for a fact because I've seen, I've seen the way some of them are. But let us always remember. Bible says, He that hath the Son hath everlasting life. He that believed not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth in him. Remember what Mark wrote in Mark 9, 43, read 44, 46, 48. Some of these verses, you'd find in modern versions, they have taken them out of the Bibles. But those verses are real. In Mark 9, 43, and if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, and the fire that shall never be quenched, where the worm died not and the fire is not quenched. Verse 46, you'll see the same thing. Verse 48, you'll find the same thing. So bear in mind that God is not a liar. And God's word does, does not lie. And if the word of God says there is a hell, there is a hell. Whether we want to believe it, yes or no, it doesn't change the fact that thus said the Lord, there is a hell. Let us not forget this. And sometimes we need to continue preaching about hell. Not to scare people into believing in Christ, though. I don't think we should serve the Lord out of fear. We serve the Lord out of love, caring for Him. So if hell is real, secondly, heaven is still real also. In Revelation 21, we read in verse 1, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. We find in Revelation 22 how God, in His Word, He describes heaven to some of us, to a great extent. It says here in Revelation 22 and 1, And He showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life would bear twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God, and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads, and there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. When you read words like these, I am sure your hearts are blessed. I am sure you are thankful to God that He saved you. I am sure, and this this is just a glimpse of it. I mean, this this is just a glimpse. Can you imagine what, what it's going to be like when we walk on those streets of gold, you know, yesterday, a day for yesterday, I think I was in Walmart and um, the bill was 28, 28, 16 or something so. And I told the cashier, I say, that is going to be a good year. <laughs> she said, oh, that is going to be a good year. I say, yes, I'll be walking on streets of gold. And she probably thought I was crazy, you know. But I... I couldn't help telling her that. I'll be walking on streets of gold. I walked out of Walmart with a big smile on my face. The girl who, there usually is a girl out by the door, they're waiting to check the stuff. And when I passed her, I said, good morning. She said, you seem happy today. I said, yes, I'm born again. <laughs> they might figure kind of crazy. To, to, you know, when you go out like that, so talking to people like that, so they might figure you're kind of off in your head. But sometimes when you realize what God has for you, you know, you just can't keep it. You, 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 got, to, you got to tell somebody. You got to say it some way. And we know that the word of God describes heaven in such a marvelous way, even in this little, this little portion of scripture that we have seen here. I cannot wait. I cannot wait to go to heaven. I mean, 
But the Lord will do things in his own time. But who is going to be in heaven, really? Who really is going to be in heaven? We know, of course, that God the Father is going to be there, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They will be there in the book of Revelation, chapter 7, verse 17. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and she shall lead them into living fountains of water, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. For John 5, 7, For there are three that bear record in heaven, or witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. So we know for sure that our Father, our Savior, our blessed Holy Spirit, we know that all of the triune Godhead is going to be in heaven for what we read here. But we also know that believers are going to be in heaven. In John 3 and 36, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. It's a present possession. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Every believer, you can rest assured on this, that your eternity is going to be with the Lord. And that is what it's all about. Knowing that after this, after this body, I mean, th this body will die if the Lord tarries is coming. This body will die and it will rot in the, in, in, in the earth. But I know that I am going to be with the Lord. I am going to be living with the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll be looking upon him as the songwriter says, I will know him by the nail prints in his hand. And he will know me. He will call me by my name. And each believer, each one of you who trusts Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, he will call you by your name. He will know you. There will be that personal attachment with him. Because his blood was shed for you. He died for you. Believers will be in heaven. His people will be in heaven. He calls them his people. Revelation 21 and 3, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with him and be there, and, they will, and he will be their God. His people. But who are his people? His people are those who he chose before this world ever came into being, according to Ephesians 1 and 4. He chose us before the foundation of the world. He chose us that we'd be holy and without blame before him in love. Who are his people? Those whose sins have been paid for by his precious blood. Hebrews 9 and 12, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood. He entered, he entered, the Bible says, into one's into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Eternal redemption for his people. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this cause, he is a mediator of the New Testament that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgression that were under the First Testament, they which Paul might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. All those who were called by him, we have that promise. An inheritance as Peter writes, that is incorruptible, one that is undefiled, one that is reserved in heaven for us. And that is what you and I have to look forward to if you're born again. And again, I would say, I don't know who's born again, except I know that I am born again. That is my personal, my personal condition that I understand about myself. I know I am born again. And you are supposed to know if you, you can't know for your wife or your husband or your child. You can't know anything about that. We can we can we can we can hope they are. We can we can trust in some of the things that we see them do and we may think they are. 
But salvation is a personal thing. And that is only between the believer and God himself. There is a hell. And there is a heaven. And we need to talk about it. Thirdly, the only way to get to heaven and to not go to hell is to understand that Jesus is the only way of salvation. There's no other way. He is the only way. When Peter was preaching in Jerusalem, he declared in Acts chapter 4, verses 10 till 12, he says, Be it known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel, Acts chapter 4, verses 10 till 12, Be it known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you hold. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given amongst men, whereby you must be saved. That name, Jesus Christ. Jehovah, our salvation. That is the only name that there is power to save someone who was born on their way to hell with a corrupt nature. That is the only name that has the power to save. Today we find that man has devised so many different ways of salvation. I have a really good friend. We've been friends for a long time. And recently I've been reading some of his writings and I'm seeing that he is shifting. No, he doesn't admit it. He says he's not priesthood of the church, but he's shifting to that. It's, it shows in the writing. It's not the church that you belong to that will save you. It's not the church that you belong to. It is Christ who saves, not the church. Your church is important. Church does not save anyone. Doesn't save anyone. People divide different ways. But God has one way. And that one way is only through the blood of Christ. And people today, lots of preachers are very hesitant to talk about the blood of Christ. But Christianity is, it is about the blood of Christ. Without the shedding of blood, no remission for sins, none. It is a blood that has a power. The blood shall never lose its power. And while we may have divided, you know, I think about Noah building that huge ark in faith, trust in God, 450 feet long, working his tail off for years, 120 years, and building an ark, expecting rain that he didn't know anything about. He didn't know what rain was like. And how God in his mercies had Noah and his family in the ark. But I'm certain that when that flood started, that many people must have jumped on the ark. But there was no help on being on the ark. There was help in being in the ark. God was the only one who could have placed them there inside. Men may devise ways. One of the ways we find today that preachers have developed in their quote-unquote churches is by leading people in a sinner's prayer. I, I, I haven't seen anything like that in the, in the Word of God. In all my years of preaching, I've never seen anywhere in the Bible where it says that we are to say, repeat this prayer after me. And after you're done, well, okay, you're saved. That is something they, that, 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 that they have introduced in churches today. Then you find that there are the other group who would say that you must be baptized if you want to be saved. There's a group that I've heard them refer, being referred to as dip or be damned. That's not true. Baptism doesn't save anyone. Baptism is an act of obedience. Yes, it, it, is, it, it is a the, the first ordinance of obedience. 
If you're born again, you ought to be scripturally baptized. And notice I'm scripturally baptized. But baptism doesn't save anyone. Baptism is an act of obedience because you're saved. Not in order to be saved. But there are churches today and Christian leaders today who are insisting that if you are to be saved, you must be baptized. That's not true. We have numerous examples of people who were not baptized and they were born again. The most common that we hear about is the, the thief on the cross. He was not baptized. But Jesus said, today, that is assurance. Today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. Christ, our Lord, gave him the assurance that he was going to be there. Church membership does not save anyone. It is important. If you want to observe the second ordinance of the Lord, the Lord's Supper, you have to be a member of a church. That is important. But it does not save. What saves? Only the blood of Christ. It is only the blood of Christ that cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Only the blood of Christ. No personal sacrifices. Sometimes people say, I'll give us much money. Paying your tithes and your offering is very important. But if you think that is the way that you're going to get to heaven, that's not the way. Money is important. It has a major part in our lives. But God, God is not going to be bribed with money. Belonging to a religious family. Salvation is not by proxy. Again, I say it's a very personal thing. Each one of us have to make sure that we are born again. I, I am born again. You are the one who have to make sure about that. And the only way you can be born again is by trusting in Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. Depending on the work that he did on the cross of Calvary. That work where he became the propitiation for our sins. That is what you trust in that. Christ Jesus died to save you from the penalty of your sins. The songwriter says, what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And back to the writer of Hebrews, Hebrews 9.22, he said, Without the shedding of blood, there is no, absolutely no remission of sin. God, our Father, pointed it out in Genesis chapter 3. He set the example in Genesis chapter 3. When he took the animal and he slew that animal, and the blood was shed for the first time, and he covered those two people who had committed sins. Our forefathers, his forefather and our foremother, whatever. Some of you, I'm sure, have heard of Dr. Harry A. Ironside. He wrote, and I quote, he says, when the Lord Jesus Christ became my surety, he went to Calvary's cross, and all my guilt was charged against him. He settled for everything. And then he cried, it is finished. And on the basis of that finished work, God can freely forgive and justify completely every poor sinners who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that means each one of us. Beloved, I would say to you this morning here, to make sure about your calling and election. Do not count on church membership or being a, a, a part of this church for how many umpteen years or whatever. But make sure that your sins were paid for by the Lord Jesus Christ. That is your personal responsibility. And I can love my wife as much as I want. And I can love my children as much as I want. My grandkids, every day, God knows. Every day I put all of them before the Lord by God's grace. And I can love them how much I want. 
but they need to know that they need to trust Christ themselves. No matter how much love I have for them, I cannot do anything to save them except to point them to the cross. Point them to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And my heart breaks sometimes when I think of some members of my family. My heart breaks. But all I can do is pray for them and try to be that blueprint that they will tend to follow. I know I feel a lot of times, but we, as God's people, ought to remember there are lots of good people who have gone on before us. Many of them have left good footprints in the sand for us. Let us look back to some of our old heroes. And I am not, look, some things that get me sick to my stomach. Bible says a little leaven would leaven the whole lump, right? How come that, because this man says some good things about grace, but we know, we know that he falters in a lot of ways in his writings and all this sort of thing. But some of these sovereign grace preachers get to me because I see them idolizing men like MacArthur and all these men. And I'm not saying that they are not that they don't have some of the theology right. I'm not saying that. But sometimes I tend to think, why do we idolize men like them? Go back to the old heroes. If you have to idolize somebody, idolize the Lord Jesus Christ. Emulate his preaching. Go by Paul. Paul was chosen by God himself on the road to Damascus. What Paul has written here in the Bible is something that was breathed of God to him. Idolize these people if we have to idolize. You know, look up to them, learn from them. But some of these new heroes that you're seeing, and with social media being what it is today, many of, the, many of them are becoming so popular amongst the, the sovereign grace crowd. And the sovereign grace crowd, they're running towards reformed position now. Again, we go back to what we were saying, brother. Are there few that be saved? Jesus would ask the question, will he find faith when he comes again? Those of us who trust Christ as our Savior, let us be standing for the truth. And may God give us grace that come with me, that we stand in spite of whatever persecution would come before us. Remember what Jude said in Jude? says that we must earnestly contend for the faith which was once and for all delivered unto the saints. We are to stand firm and by God's grace continue preaching what the Bible says. These old, these old messages that were once, it is said that when, um, I can't remember the name of that preacher who preached sinners in the hand of a living, um, an angry God, sinners in the hands of an angry God. He said when he preached that sermon that people were gripping their, their, their seats while he was preaching. We need to have preachers who would be standing firm and proclaiming God's word as it is. And not just talking about all the niceties of heaven. We need to talk about that, but we're not, we're not, we're not supposed to just talk about all the niceties. We have to talk about reality of what God has in the word for us. But I trust by God's grace that this exhortation this morning will be a benefit to you. And I am thankful to God for giving me the opportunity to share it with you all. I trust that by God's grace that your hearts have been blessed and that by the Lord's grace we grow in grace and we grow in knowledge. We grow in our determination to serve the Lord. God bless you, brother.